Wow. Love you guys. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the history way before you guys were born, some of you, <laughs> and talk a little bit about what was the world like before video games. It was boring. It was really boring. So I decided I needed to fix that. I was born a geek. But when I was born in the 50s, being a geek meant you were a ham radio operator. That's boring too. So when I was in college, I worked at an amusement park while getting an engineering degree. Yeah, that kind of stuff. But there was a game that was called Speedway. And it was a series of slide projectors and film against, and that's the image that you got. If you looked behind, this is what the circuitry was. It was a nightmare. You could not keep it running to just play a driving game. I decided there had to be something better. The computers at the days, they started having, there was a ping pong game. This was my professor. What he was working on was a screen buffer. That was more memory, or less memory, than you have on your cell phone. But this is where I was introduced to video games. This was a, this is a PDP-1, and it was about a million dollars at the time. And this is the game that we would play. Steve Russell programmed that. And so I was working at the amusement park summers, playing this game in the labs winters, and I said, if I could put that game in my arcade, it would make money. But you divide a million dollar computer, 25 cents a play, and the math didn't work. So it was very simple. I said, someday, the costs are going to come down enough that it will make sense. A company was doing a computer course. This was also film, playing a, a, a trivia game. And then I designed this game called Computer Space. And it turned out to be a modest hit. We sold about $2 million worth. And it was a license. And I got a royalty. And that was enough money to start Pong. Computer space was very complex. But what I learned is that complex isn't necessarily good when it comes to games. Simple was actually better. And so that brought on Pong. And the market exploded. Absolutely exploded. It was a very simple game. Magnavox did a home game. It did okay, but this one really exploded. And that really launched Atari. It was a single game. All it could play was Pong. But then Atari figured out that people wanted more and different games. So we started building all kinds of different games but they were 
one game, one console. And then we decided maybe it was time to create multiple games, and that led to the 2600. And it became a massive, massive success. How many of you have all played the 2600? Everybody, almost. Yeah. Really, really crappy graphics. <laughs> Horrible graphics. We did pin. This was a big Bertha. We did driving games. I did a, a restaurant company. Did an eight-player driver. That unit earned a million dollars in a year at Disneyland. <coughs> Excuse me. This was our factory. And the idea is that we wanted to be passionate. It turns out that Atari not just innovated games, but we did a whole bunch of different ideas. This is what it was like to be an engineer when Atari started. I don't see anybody dressed like that today. So the fact that you can be an engineer, a software programmer, and come to work looking like shit, thank me. This is the new normal. It's actually quite a bit cooler. This is actually from Intel. Uh, the guy on the left was a guy named Bob Noyce, and he was a friend of mine. We used to play chess and uh, he founded Intel. During that time, Silicon Valley was bubbling with innovation. Now, the world is bubbling with innovation. I'd be willing to bet that half of you sitting here today have an idea for a business or an app or a game that you're working on. Entrepreneurship is a great, great benefit. And who knows, maybe the next Atari or the next Apple is being formed in the garage right here in Belo Horizonte. Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be cool? Come on. That would be cool, right? <laughs> and, it, and, you, and, and some of you are saying, the next apple from Belo Horizonte? The reason it is not out of the question is because of the internet. The world is your marketplace. Innovation has the ability to become viral. And you have the ability to create massive innovations and big companies no matter where you are in the world. But what you need to do is to think about the special things the Brazilian culture has. First of all, you speak Portuguese, which is not a common language. That's good and that's bad. One, it gives you a chance to start a local company without necessarily having to compete with everyone else. So you have an indigenous market that is much more pliable than others. And getting big is easier than going from tiny to medium size. Tiny to medium size is the hard part. That's where most companies die. 
And so, if, so you can create a Portuguese company and become medium-sized, and that'll give you the, the, the infrastructure that'll allow you to go worldwide. Anyway. We used to do planning sessions. We'd do it at the beach. We'd do it with a bunch of people. And we learned something about creativity. And creativity is hard. What is a really new idea? And it turns out that most of you have a really good idea, but it's tucked clear back in your brain. And really, really revolutionary ideas are kind of embarrassing because they seem crazy. And when you ask people, they'll say, that's a crazy idea. And so you say, well, maybe, maybe I shouldn't do it. But those are the ideas that make massively big companies. Let me explain this. The Baharo Dunes, we would list the products that we wanted to pursue. And we generally get 10 or 15 on the list. And then I'd say, now I want another 10, but only ones that are really crazy really stupid ideas. I only want stupid and crazy ideas. And so we'd get another 10. We'd have lunch, and then I'd turn the list upside down and said, okay, now we have to produce one of these crazy ideas. My people would look at me like I'd lost my mind. I said, trust me, I have, in fact, lost my mind, but I run this thing, and I'll fire you if you don't figure out one of these things. I actually didn't say that, but, but they knew. They knew. <laughs> so, there's an interesting thing about the way your mind works. When you initially see an idea, you think about why it won't work. But when you all of a sudden have to put your brain in gear and say, how can I make it work? You start to see opportunities. It turns out that my most successful products were games and projects that were started from the bottom part of the list, from the crazy part of the list. Innovations are almost always considered crazy. When the automobile was first invented, nobody took it serious. I mean, nobody. Why would you have this noisy, sometimes it would work, sometimes it didn't? A horse always worked. An airplane. Why in the world would somebody want to go into the air? It's dangerous. It can crash. The telephone. Why would you want to talk to somebody that you couldn't see when I can just walk down the street and see them and talk to them? Nobody believed that the telephone had any possibility. When they first saw the telephone, do you know what they thought it was going to be good for? for playing music. On and on and on. Television. The first television sets had a screen that was about this big, black and white. And people said, why would you want to watch that? It was the start. And that's what you need to look for. Crazy ideas. Crazy is good. Insanity is way underrated. You've got to stay playful. 
Now, some of you have probably been asking yourself, what about Nolan's shoes? <laughs> now, I put on these shoes and people say, oh, I've seen kids in those. <laughs> and I said, yeah, why haven't you been seeing more adults in them? And they said, well, we thought it was for kids. And I said, how do you define a kid? I said, one of the things that kids do is they're not constrained. They're not beaten out. The creativity hasn't been beaten out of them again. Have you realized how much of your creativity has been beaten out of you in school? Horrible. By the time you get through school, your creativity quotient has gotten way down. So you've got to re-engage your inner child. You've got to be willing to be silly. You've got to be willing to be childlike, because childlike is innovative. You've got to be willing to wear light-up shoes. And you say, would I want a pair of light-up shoes? And the answer really should be yes, because you never know when you're going to need that light to keep from stumbling over a rock or something else. But more than that, everybody will know that you're a little nuts, which is a benefit all by itself. Anyway, let's be creative. Let's think of new things. Let's not focus on what is. Let's focus on what will be. Which is better? Building a great video game or being a player on an F NFL team? Or here in Brazil, we'll, we'll call it football, meaning soccer. But anyway, you know what I mean. Which would you rather be, a great video game player or a great football player? Let me make a prediction. Last year, more people watched eSports, video games being played by professional, than watched American football soccer, European, Brazilian football, combined. In 10 years, eSports will be 20 times the size of any physical activity. 20 times the size. And so, this is an eSports event in Madison Square Garden. Last year, it was the only time that Madison Square Garden was totally sold out. No seats left, standing room only. Esports. So, instead of out practicing in your backyard, get your fingers really loosened up, become a competitor. Passion is all about working hard and playing hard. Now, when you're playing a game, are you working or are you playing? You're playing, right? Because it's something that's fun. We all like to play, but we can get along and do it the other way. At Atari, we always had a game room. Most companies have it. We have parties. 
I don't know if you remember, we had a game called E.T. that ended up in, our, in the trash cram. That's what happens when you do a really crappy game. You end up throwing away. It was the biggest loss that Sears Roebuck ever had, and it almost bankrupted Warner Communications. I had sold it by then, and I knew that it was a crappy game, and I shorted the Warner Communications stock. I made more money when Atari failed than I did when I sold it. They were idiots. Anyway. I don't know if you know who these two guys are, but this is Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. They worked for me when they were 19 and 20 years old. I hired them, and I had a chance to be the first investor in Apple. I could have had one-third of Apple computer for $50,000. I had $50,000 at the time. I said no. I have regretted that several times. <laughs> they did the game breakout for me. And this was, a, this was Atari's first building. This is Atari's second building. This is where Steve Jobs and Wozniak worked for me. This was our third building. This all happened in four years. We were on hyper growth. This is what our pr production looked like. This is a thing called a tarry tell. And it was what Warner Communication turned our modem project into. I wanted to create a network of game players over regular telephone lines. And the idea was to have a bunch of closets, small places full of, of modems, and that I was going to link those closets together with a T1. I believe that this was a project that was killed by Warner after I sold it. I believe if I hadn't sold Atari and had completed that network of game players, it would have turned into the internet. And I think that on that basis, I would have ended up owning the internet. That would have been cool too, but maybe not. You never know. These are the Warner guys. These are all the, the... Here's another thing. When we first designed the 2600, we thought that the maximum number of software titles that we'd ever play was 16. That was the total number of games that we thought the hardware was strong enough to be able to play. But with the magic of software, these are the number of games that were built for it. That goes to show you, you can't always predict the future. This, we, re we really thought that we could only do about 16 games. Who's the guy in the middle? guy named Masaya Nakamura, the founder of Namco. Now Namco, it turns out, was a small kitty ride manufacturer in Japan. We had started a company called Atari Japan. And we didn't go through all the process of getting authorized and things like that. We actually took suitcases full of cash, turned them into, and started a company there. Well, it turns out that we violated about 150 rules in Japan. 
And so we decided the only way to keep from going to jail was to sell it. And so we sold it to Nakamura. And that put Nakamura into the video game business for the first time. And this was the sale that happened right then. E.T. Now let's talk about the future a little bit. This is my virtual reality company. And in VR, we, of course, had to do ping. It's really like Pong, but now you're the paddle. And the ball's coming towards you, and you have to pull the paddle in front of you. It's really a lot of fun. We were just in an amusement park, and you got to play a full game of ping for five bucks in virtual reality. And we, were, we have been earning almost $2,000 a day ever since we installed, which was a good return for a game. We've also got a game called Haunted, that, called Ghost Mansion, which is, is, is Halloween getting to be important here in Brazil and all? Halloween, where you call it, you know, it's a great, it's a great thing. It'll get bigger. Don't worry about it. It's way too much fun. I mean, the idea of knocking on doors and having people give you candy, what's not to like about that? It's a good thing. But anyway, we had this ghost manor. People love to get scared. We scared them. We have Project Zenith, which is a spaceship, an abandoned spaceship full of creepy crawlers, alien creepy crawlers that you have to shoot. That's fun. This is a picture of what ping looks like in VR. And this is our uh, Project Zenith, where you can become a you can become a superhero and throw plasma balls at the guy on standing on the other side. Nobody can figure out what this is, but this is coming, and it's really creepy. We are all millennials. And this is one of our rules. We said, player experience first. Focus on the player. Focus on the player. Focus on the player. Challenge convention. Don't do what everybody else is doing. Do something different. Do something weird. Do something truly revolutionary. Do something that your mother will tell you that you're not supposed to do. Focus on talent. Only let the best come and work for you and fire people who are incompetent. Gone. Get, get bad people out of your life. Don't hire dead people. Dead people, they're in a box and they have no life. Unfortunately, some of them are still walking around. You gotta find out who they are and not hire them. Or if you've made a mistake and you've happened to have hired a dead person, you just have to let them go away. Don't hire the dead. People who die from the neck up need to wake up and become a full, vibrant, passionate person. I went to a high school reunion a few years ago. And these are people that I grew up with, that I went to high school with. And they're all in their 60s when I went. Two thirds of them had died, but were still walking around. And it was amazing to me how many people choose to think of themselves as their life is over, when in fact it's just beginning. Stay hungry and stay humble. 
when you're successful, it's hard to stay humble because everybody's telling you what a cool person you are. That's where you, your children and your wife come in because they will constantly tell you what an idiot you are. It helps you stay humble. And that's it. I, I love my life right now. I think that the game business helps you stay young, helps you stay excited, and I read all the time about artificial intelligence taking away our jobs. I am not at all afraid of artificial intelligence. What I am afraid of is natural stupidity. Natural stupidity is a much bigger problem. There's this thing called common sense. It's so mis you know, it, it's mislabeled. There is so little common sense around that it's crazy. Let's talk about robots. Robots are going to make the world a much better place. They say, but what about jobs? There are only three reasons that you need to worry about jobs. One, lack of imagination. I can think of worlds, and read science fiction, I can think of worlds that I want to live in that will take 100% of everybody that is currently working on today's crappy stuff to build the world that I want to live in. Let's take self-driving cars as an example. Think how many people will be out of work because they're not drivers anymore. But what I want to be able to do is I want to live in a world that has zero traffic jams. That means that we can build tunnels because they'll be electric. But more than that, every cab will be able to have a container and that container can be left at a corner when it turns left and picked up by a cab that's going right. How many know what a packet switch network is? Basically in data there's all kinds of routing of packets. Self-driving cars, self-driving ca taxis will be able to create a packet switch network for things, including people. In 20 years, you will be able to get free cab service from anywhere in your city to anywhere else as part of your Amazon Prime network. Now think about it. Why? It's because it'll be essentially part of when you buy stuff, when you, when you move, th move goods, you might as well move people. Most subway systems, most mass transit, I'm giving United States numbers, but a ticket to ride on the metro is generally around two dollars. The cost of the government, here's about one, the cost of the government to provide that surface is about four dollars. There's subsidies in order to get that. Most of the travel is less than five miles. It's usually about three, ten, about eight, somewhere between three and eight kilometers. The cost 
to have an electric taxi that's auto drive for that same trip is about 70 cents. So, which would you rather do, take mass transit or a cab? You say, but hey, all of a sudden, we're going to have massive traffic jams. Ah, not so much. Because a self-driving car can allow traffic to move at speed, nose to tail. The effect of that is that it increases the capacity of every lane of traffic by somewhere between eight and 10 times. So do you think there'll be traffic jams if all of a sudden every road you're thinking of is eight times wider? I don't think so. We are gonna have a great future. I want it to happen sooner. My, you know, I don't expect to live much past about 130, 140. So you've got to get hurry, you guys have to hurry up and invent all this stuff for me, because I want to live there, you know? And you say, what are you, crazy? You think you're going to live to 130, 140? I encourage you to look up and start to understand DNA editing with a technology called CRISPR. Has any of you heard of CRISPR yet? Magical. And all of a sudden, if you can increase the length of the telomeres, cancer is toast. Most cancers will be wiped out within the next eight to 10 years primarily because of our own immune system. And so you get rid of cancer, you get rid of heart disease, now all you have to do is deal with replication errors, and the typical human being with those things should be able to last to at least 130 years. So, that means there's gonna be a whole bunch of us <laughs> and I'm hopeful. So, your homework assignment is one, read science fiction, read, about half science fiction is a post-apocalyptic, read the optimistic stuff too, get an idea of the world that can be, help design the world that can be, be willing to be crazy, be willing to change the world, be this agent of change, be this person who's nuts, and we'll all have a better time. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to have some questions, if I could. Is, is it okay if I have a selfie with you? You guys are great. See, one of the things that Brazilians have that you should capitalize, you have passion. You know, really. I look out here and I don't see a single dead person. There probably is, but anyway, you gotta understand that passion is number one. Number one, stay alive, stay vibrant, stay crazy. You guys in Brazil have got it. Anyway. So. Okay. I'll answer questions in which you speak Portuguese, but I listen in English, if it's okay. Okay, sure. I got you. Yeah. No. 
it's actually okay to ask me things that are embarrassing. Uh, first of all, Mr. Nolan, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I just want to say that you're my personal hero, and I think for a lot of people here as well. So uh, thank you. And I have two simple questions, to be honest. The first one would be if, uh, what do you think about Atari uh, kind of rising from the dead after the bankruptcy? And do you think that the Atari box will live up to its name? Just that. First of all, I love the Atari brand. And I think that the new Atari box project is good. I think it's, is it going to displace Xbox or PlayStation or really, really good PC gaming? No. But I think it'll have a place in the market. It's going to be cheap. It's going to be pretty open. Um, there's a lot of good things about it. And uh, I'm enthusiastic. Hi, hi, Nolan. I would like to know how did you, how, how did you do, how did you work, and how did you live your professional life and your personal life together? That's a very good question. The reality is that work and personal life sometimes conflicts. I have eight children. A lot of people think that's too many. But I did it from intellectual arrogance. I felt that all the dumb people were having too many kids. And that, that I wanted to have some really smart kids to sort of balance the genetic inventory. <laughs> But more than that, The number one pro responsibility of a parent is education. And I felt that I needed to make sure all my kids understood business, understood life. And as a result, my baby boy just turned 24. He started his first company when he graduated from high school. Last year, he did three million in sales you know, and at 22. So he's great. My oldest son just completed a, 40 mil, a $20 million dollar raise at a $50 million dollar valuation building a micro amusement park. My number two son just started an arcade business called Polycade. And My third son is working for my first son, and my fourth son is writing two books and designing video games for another company. So I feel like they're doing pretty cool. My daughters, one is the go-to go PR person um, for PR in technology. My second daughter married well and is having a great time because, because she's got a rich husband, which I guess is success. <laughs> My third daughter is a financial planner, and she is running the money that it, all the rest of us have. So I'm really happy with my kids. But here's the trick. One, take one of your kids out for breakfast every Sunday. Quality time is more important than quantity. Second, read to your kids all the time. Read, read, read. My mom read to me. I read to all my kids. I. I read 
by having a lot of kids, you read sometimes the same book. And it got to the point where I could almost recite the books. Have you ever heard of Fox in Socks? Chicks with bricks come, chick with blocks come, chicks with bricks and blocks and clocks come. Anyway, I can damn near tell that whole book by heart. Kids are the best thing you can do. And at my age, I can honestly say I'm much more proud of my family than I am of anything I did in business. So. No, first of all, it's a pleasure to talk with you. I just want to know what can we ex what do you expect from the video games and the user experience in the next 50 years? Say again, I'm sorry. I just want to know what do you expect from the user experience and the video games in the next 50 years? Ah. I expect in the next 50 years, few years, I think that there will be a slow ascendance of VR. I think that AR is going to be very important. Augmented reality showed its power with Pokemon Go. It was massive, and then it crashed, because it was a crappy game. So. I believe that somebody is going to come up with a really cool AR game that is going to have some of the nature of Pokemon Go, but with longevity. That's one prediction. The second prediction is, I think that there will be an integration between board games and things like the Amazon Echo. Amazon Echo probably won't be in Brazil for a couple of years because it takes voice recognition. So I know they've got, now they've got English and German. Next year they'll have Spanish and I think the following year they'll have Italian and uh, Portuguese. Maybe Russian. Nobody can understand Russian. But <laughs> But I think that, that, those, that those will become gaming platforms. And uh, like if I were in Brazil right now and I spoke Portuguese, I would design a game for the Amazon Echo in Portuguese so that as soon as Amazon decides to start marketing here, they will spend a whole bunch of money marketing your product because you'll be the only ones there. Trust me, I'm predicting the future. Somebody in this audience will make a few million dollars on Amazon Echo games here in Brazil. Is it you or you? Ah, oh, you're all too lazy. No. <laughs> Nolan, é um prazer estar aqui contigo aqui, e com o pessoal aqui que te admira bastante. É você como um pilar da indústria. Eu queria eu tenho mais uma curiosidade do que uma pergunta. Eu queria saber se ainda joga, se ainda há tempo de jogar. É, o que você anda jogando, se você joga e qual foi o jogo que te marcou durante a sua vida? Yes, I still play. I play a lot. Um, in fact, if you were to look at my phone. I actually have the biggest memory that I can buy. And I had to delete a bunch of games the other day to fit new ones on. I download a brand new game probably three or four times a week. At least half of them are horrible. And I immediately get rid of them. 
there's some good ones, and I keep playing them. When it comes to console games, one of my favorites is on the Xbox with the Kinect, Just Dance. I can tell you right now that with a bunch of your friends, with a lot of alcohol, you can have more fun with that. I can tell you right now that m myself and three of my sons have the definitive version of Ghostbusters. Who are you going to call, you know? Um, I also really liked Portal. I got really into Portal. I like League of Legends and Call of Duty, but I'm not good at it. Here's, here's an ugly truth. You lose about a millisecond of reaction time with every year that you're older than 26. So that means that when you're my age, I'm hopeless. My boys can kill me, have me buried, be on to the next thing before I know I've even been shot. But if it comes to being tricky, stealth, guile, cheating, I'm your guy. <laughs> there. Two more? Here. Okay. Uh, hi, Mr. Virginio. Uh I have a weird question to ask you. I was with you at Brazil Game Show a few weeks ago, and I gave to you, I don't know if you remember, I gave, gave to you a little bottle of cachaça, Minera. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I would like to ask you if you all tasted it and if you enjoy the cachaça. I need a couple more. <laughs> okay, I can provide to you. Thank my, mom, my mom made that one. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I got to tell you, when it's hot outside, and you want a Caprina. It's about as good as it gets. And, and I, I thank you very much. I had my first Caprina sitting on the beach in Rio. And I said, ah, I get it. I get it, this is really good. And, um, and I've been a fan ever since. And his mother, brews her own conchasa. It was smooth, it was good, and it's now gone. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Mr. Mushnil. I First of all, I would like to thank you and for hearing me now. <laughs> and I'm a great fan of you, and I think most of you guys are here. And I believe that our generation isn't between two generations and the future one that's growing now, our kids, and the older now that it's uh, and don't have that access to technology. And how we c how we think that we can bring the innovation also to that that past generation that's that's behind of us and bring to them what we live in and what creativity. You know, you know in some ways. Because of the maturity of the market, you have a lot harder time than I did. Because when I was just starting out, I had no competition. You know, if I wanted to do a baseball game, there was no other baseball game. If I wanted to do a lot of these things, right now, I'd be willing to bet that every time you have a good idea, you go on to the app store or you go on to the Google store, and you find a game that's already there. So it's hard to innovate. 
until you get yourself into a different mode. And so think about a game which is you have a cell phone, your friend has a cell phone, and maybe there's a tablet in the middle. Now it's not exactly a board game. It's not exactly a video game. It's a combination. I haven't seen anything like that. There's maybe one out there. But I, I mean, right now in the United States, there's a huge resurgence in board games. How many have played Settlers of Catan? It's a good game. Think about Dungeons and Dragons. How many of you play Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah, yeah, see? Now, think about the Amazon Echo or your tablet being a dungeon master. Somebody needs to design that because you can't always get a bunch of people. And, and you know, having a crappy dungeon master isn't that good. But it's a great game. So you've got to sort of have one foot in the back, one foot in the, the future, and figure out some way new because entertainment is driven by innovation. We get bored. Why do we like to travel? We see new things. We experience new cuisine. It's different. Different drives entertainment. And so in order to be successful, if you want to stay and make a career out of this, think out of the box. And, and, and take, you know, can I turn my toothbrush and a pair of dirty socks, can I put those together into a game? Maybe that's too hard. Okay. <laughs> but, but what you've got to do is you've got to unstick your brain. Our brains get stuck in what is. What we need to do is get our brains into what might be. How can we do weird stuff? How can we learn unity? How can we build something that is weird? Your cell phone today has all kinds of accelerometers on it. Have you seen anything in which you can write in script and have the phone discard, you know, do it? So answer, answer a text by writing in script. The phone should be able to do it. Code it, do it. Might be a big thing, might be bigger than WhatsApp. Google will buy it for a billion dollars. That's okay. A billion dollars is still enough money. <laughs> anyway. Thank you very much. Love you all. Stay alive. Do a meet and greet. Bate fotos la selfie no, no omni. O selfies van a ser no omni con Nolan. Ok? Tienen que devolver antes los uh, auriculares de traducción. Ok? ¿Está bien? O selfies with you. Oh, ok. I, I would like to ask you what do you think about Campus Party? I think Campus Party is so exciting. I love it. I love it. I love it. 
First of all, this represents a collection of the most passionate gaming community in the world. It's, it's like coming to a, con a, a celebration of gaming in all forms. Thank you. Thank you.